Hello, and welcome to uh, Block 8, the sixth set of notes, the last set of notes for this block. This is Paranoia Confirmed, The House Divided Cannot Stand. And our talk about um, this part of American history needs to, t needs to start with um, a look at the greatest of all American presidents, and one of the, one of the if not the greatest American ever to live, uh, Abraham Lincoln. You're going to read about Lincoln um, for one of your Block 8 assignments, um, but it does do some good to talk about Lincoln from uh, the time he was born, and he was a small child, and even before. Um, his parents uh, were of Scotch-Irish stock and had kind of moved along the frontier. It was his great-grandfather, I believe, that had emigrated to the United States. Uh, he was born the youngest child of Thomas and Nancy Lincoln on February the 12th, 1809, in a log cabin in Kentucky. Um, he had an older sister named Nancy. Uh, she had an older sister named Sarah. Lincoln claimed when he was a politician um, that his young life was simply quote the short, simple annals of the poor. Uh, that was not exactly true. Uh, his father was pretty solidly middle class until 1816, when Lincoln was uh, seven years old, when he lost all of his land in a, uh, a legal land dispute, uh, and the family became poor. Uh, Thomas Lincoln had to move his family several times before finally settling in, in Illinois as poor farmers. And it would be in Illinois that Lincoln would make uh, his name. You see the log cabin uh, in the top right part of the notes. This was the type of dwelling that many, many, many frontier uh, farmers lived in. Uh, the actual cabin uh, does no longer exist. It was taken down before Lincoln's death. Uh, for many years, uh, there was a log cabin uh, that people thought was the one that Lincoln was born in, but uh, research proved that it was not. Um, but the one in the picture very well could have been. That it was a simple dwelling, um, just like hundreds of thousands of others on the American frontier. Abraham Lincoln had precisely one year of, former, for, one year of formal schooling, and after that he was self-taught. He would... Uh, borrow books, uh, take books, and read by the firelight, uh, teaching himself at night. Uh, he was always tall for his age, and even though he was very thin, he was very strong. He gained a reputation for physical strength and strength of character at a very young age. By the age of 21, Lincoln is sick and tired of farm life and says goodbye to his parents uh, and goes to make his way in the world. He floated down the Mississippi River on a raft to New Orleans, where for the first time uh, he observed the institution of slavery, and seeing the slaves in chains down in New Orleans uh, made Lincoln an anti-slavery person uh, from the beginning of his adult life. He became anti-slavery on that day uh, in New Orleans. He took a steamboat back up the river to Illinois, where he served as a, he was elected a militia captain in the Black Hawk War, although he never did see action. Uh, but the fact that a mere 21, 22-year-old uh, young man could get himself elected militia captain in his local community meant that he obviously had a persuasive way about him and a kind of a, a magnetism of character. At age 23, he set up a business with a friend, but it failed. Uh, he decided to run for political office for the Illinois General Assembly, and he lost. Uh, after that, he took some random government jobs and decided to teach himself the law. So he read the law, and in 1836 was admitted to the bar, um, and after being admitted to the bar and practicing for a short while, he won election to the Illinois General Assembly. So at the age of 27 years old, Lincoln was a politician. And what sort of politician was he? Uh, Lincoln was a free soil Whig, uh, straight up and down. He thought slavery was a moral evil, but he also felt that most abolitionists did nothing to actually bring about the end of slavery. That all of the moralizing and holier-than-thou speeches coming from abolitionists did very little to convert anybody to their cause. And in fact, they turned lots of people off, Lincoln said. He did not believe that slavery should be uh, able to spread. That's what made him a free soiler. Uh, he supported internal improvements. He supported the tariff. He was an admirer of Henry Clay. Uh, and that's what made him a Whig. Um, around the early 1840s, he was engaged to one Mary Todd, the daughter of a prominent Kentucky family, a prominent Kentucky slaveholding family. Uh, Lincoln broke off the engagement in 1840. He, Lincoln had actually fallen in love beforehand, and the girl he fell in love with died uh, of some disease or other. Uh, and so Mary Todd came into his life. They grew close, but Lincoln called off the engagement. But it seems 
uh, that he had promised her father that he would marry her. So in 1842, they got back together and they got married. It was never a happy marriage from day one, and most people who knew claimed, probably rightfully so, that Lincoln never loved her. Uh, she loved him. Uh, and she was really into furthering his career, and she constantly pushed him and pushed him and pushed him. Uh, but Lincoln, Lincoln didn't love his wife, um, and he could get a little frustrated with her. Uh, Mary Todd, uh, it was said, Lincoln said of her that the God himself only needed one D, but the Todd family needed two. Lincoln, although he was kind of a distant husband, was a doting and loving father. He had four children. Um, only one of them would survive. Uh, he, he outlived two of them, and only one of his children would survive into adulthood. One of him, one of his children, died at age four in 1850, and another would die at age 12 when Lincoln was president. Uh, so while the Civil War was going on, uh, Lincoln was also dealing with some personal tragedy as well. Uh, his character, Lincoln. Uh, was subject to fits of what he called melancholia. At one point, he said that if all the sor if all of my sorrows were evenly distributed among the human race, there would not be a single happy soul in the world. Um, and we, he called it melancholia. We would probably today um, diagnose Lincoln with clinical depression, um, in all likelihood. He was a successful lawyer. Uh, defending pretty much anyone who came his way. He had a folksy manner. His life on the farm and, you know, going down the Mississippi River gave him a steady supply of anecdotes and jokes. And he was personable, and he was ambitious. Uh, and he turned that ambition into an election to Congress. In 1846, he was elected to the House of Representatives as Illinois' only Whig. He wrote a bill, he co-sponsored a bill outlawing slavery in the District of Columbia, but it failed to pass. He was strongly against the Mexican War. He felt that it was a war to spread slavery. And he tried to pass through Congress something that he called the Spot Resolutions. That if you remember from Block 7, President Polk went to war with Mexico based on the fact that American blood had been spilled on American soil. Well, Lincoln got up in Congress and he said, Mr. President, show me the exact spot where this alleged incident took place. And that's why they're called the Spot Resolutions. What is the spot, Mr. President, where these so -called, this so-called attack was supposed to take place? Lincoln's challenge was ignored by Congress, uh, the press, and obviously by the President. Lincoln supported the Wilmot Proviso, which, if you remember, was this, uh, the amendment to the funding law for the Mexican War that said no slavery would be allowed in the territories taken from Mexico. Uh, but after a single two-year term, Lincoln had lost support uh, back home uh, based on his uh, support for the spot resolutions. Lincoln did not bother to run again. He chose not to stand for re-election, and he returned home to practice law. And he said at the time that he was perfectly happy to spend the rest of his days as a country lawyer. And if it weren't for Mary Todd, his wife, kind of pushing him, go do something else with your life, Abe, um, he likely would have stayed there. His return to politics was, you know, A, because of his wife, and B, because of the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Lincoln did not believe in racial equality um, ever in his life, but he certainly did believe that slavery was an absolute moral evil. And he said it in a sentence uh, that really, it showed Lincoln's ability to communicate thoughts very simply and complex ideas distilled down to folk wisdom that was obvious, but a lot of people, in trying to argue, you know, highfalutin theories, just couldn't come up with. And Lincoln simply said, when asked about slavery, Lincoln said, if slavery is not wrong, nothing is wrong. Um, and most people in the North, even if they might not have been abolitionists, even if they might not have believed in racial equality, could certainly get behind Lincoln's formulation that if slavery was not wrong, nothing was wrong. Lincoln decided, uh, with his wife's prodding, to run for Senate in 1854. Now, if you remember from Block 4, senators at the time were elected by the state legislatures. So Lincoln had to get support in the state legislature. He got some support at first, but then it trailed off 
Uh, his support dwindled, he instructed his remaining backers to back somebody else, and Lincoln did not win the, his party's nomination for Senate in 1854. But as the Whig party was splintering, Lincoln played an important role out west in Illinois, uh, and in other areas around Illinois, in the formation and in the creation of the Republican Party. Now, if you remember, Lincoln had been a Whig, but slavery had destroyed the Whig party. That the Cotton Whigs and the Conscience Whigs divided, uh, and the party split into two halves, neither one of which was uh, strong enough to win any sorts of elections. After the, when the, Lincoln, Lincoln stayed a Whig, even though there was no more Whig party. And Lincoln said, I was a Whig and the party left me. I didn't know what to call myself. He was, he, people started to call him an abolitionist, although he was not in favor, and he never was in favor until the middle of the Civil War. This is very important to remember. Up until the election and beyond of 1860, Lincoln is not in favor of interfering with slavery in the territories and in the states where it already existed. Lincoln's big thing was preventing the spread of slavery and preserving the Union, not ending slavery where it existed. He was not an abolitionist. So Lincoln was a man without a party. So Lincoln kind of said, and a lot of people were saying the same things, that we need a new party to represent what I think. Better to define myself my, and provide a platform for my beliefs, we need a new political party. So Lincoln worked to create the Republican Party. And as we saw, it consisted of old Whigs like himself, free soilers like himself, the old Liberty Party, which were abolitionists, and anti-slavery Democrats. His time in Congress and his work as a lawyer and his work in creating the Republican Party made him something of a national figure. And in 1856, when the Republicans were nominating their first ticket, uh, Lincoln was put up for vice president to run with John C. Fremont. Uh, he did not win the vice, presid vice presidential nomination, but he did come in second place, which um, marked him as something of an up-and-comer. Two years later, in 1858, the Illinois Republicans nominated Lincoln for Senate. And this Senate race was going to pit Abraham Lincoln for the Republicans against the little giant himself, Stephen Douglas, for the Democrats. The most famous uh, Democrat in all the land was going to be running against this tall, gangly, prairie lawyer uh, for Illinois' all-important Senate seat. And it was here giving this nomination, or accepting the nomination of his party, that Lincoln gave the speech that gives this block its title, the House Divided Speech. And I'm going to read this to you, and because um, it is, it shows Lincoln's power of simplicity, that politicians at the time, and orators at the time, public speakers at the time, were famous and expected to use you know, high-sounding, elite-sounding language. Um, and Lincoln, Lincoln had none of that. Lincoln had the ability to craft a phrase um, that was simple and easy to understand and incredibly powerful. And his house-divided uh, speech electrified the country. And he alludes to the Gospel of Mark in the Bible. Uh, where the house divided is uh, is in that part of the New Testament. So here's Lincoln's, uh, the relevant part of the house divided speech, and listen to what it means. Lincoln said, A house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall. But I do expect that it will cease to be divided. It will become all one thing or all the other. Either the opponents of slavery will arrest the further spread of it and place it where the public mind shall rest in the belief that it is in the course of ultimate extinction, or its advocates will push it forward till it shall become alike lawful in all the states, old as well as new, north as well as south. And what Lincoln is saying here is that the country cannot exist half slave and half free. 
it will eventually one day either be all free, or it eventually one day will be all slave. And you see his wiggishness, his wiggery, his wig, te um, his wig tendencies as a union man. He says, I don't expect the union to be dissolved, but we cannot go on being half one thing and half another. We're going to stop the biography of Lincoln at this point, and we're going to see Lincoln again shortly in these Lincoln-Douglas debates um, while the two men are running for Senate. But for now, we need to get back to the story. Number two, the Lecompton Constitution in Kansas and the destruction of the Democratic Party. If you remember Bleeding Kansas, pro-slavery and anti-slavery settlers were battling it out, killing over 200 settlers uh, on both sides combined. When President Buchanan became president, he uh, was determined to put a stop to the violence. He appointed uh, Robert J. Walker as governor, and Governor Walker went to Kansas and stopped the violence through the threat and through the application of force. He said, you people go over there, you people go over there, and the fighting is over. And Walker was successful in stopping the bloodshed uh, in early 1840, uh, 1857. But the politics of Kansas were not over. The pro-slavery side, now, Kansas is ready to join the Union. It has a territorial legislature, which, if you remember, was dominated by pro-slavery people and okayed by President Pierce. This pro-slavery uh, legislature calls a constitutional convention for the purposes of, sta of declaring statehood. And it is a pro-slavery group which calls this convention. The free soil people in Kansas boycott the convention. So the pro the excuse me, the anti-slavery people boycott the convention. So with no anti-slavery people there, the pro-slavery settlers um, wrote a constitution and then refused to hold it up for a fair vote. Governor Walker, the representative of the government, saw this and said, this cannot stand. He went back to Washington and informed President Buchanan that the Constitution that Kansas was going to submit to Congress was unfair, illegitimate, and did not represent the views of all the people of Kansas. Buchanan ignores him. Buchanan is only listening to Southern advisors, even though he is a Northern Democrat. President Buchanan ignores Walker and instructed Congress and the Democratic Party to admit Kansas based on the Lecompton Constitution. Congress gets the bill in front of it. Shall we admit Kansas? This brought President Buchanan in direct confrontation with Stephen Douglas. Douglas needs Northerners in the Democratic Party. Douglas is the leader of all the Northerners that are left in the Democratic Party. Douglas is the leader of all of the moderates and the non-extremists in the Democratic Party. Douglas has himself a big dilemma. If he agrees with the, his own president, his party's own president, if he agrees with his own president, then he is going against his baby of popular sovereignty. Remember, Douglas's whole thing is the people should decide. Well, the people in Kansas clearly did not decide, and Douglas knows that. And if Douglas accepts that, he is going against what he has believed and he has fought for for the better part of a decade now. And he would also be admitting that the Dred Scott decision, which was so unpopular in the North, was right. If he says that Buchanan ha that Kansas will be admitted as a slave state immediately, and that no territorial legislature can ban slavery, then Douglas is not only going against popular sovereignty, he's also going in favor of Dred Scott. That is not going to win him any votes in the North. And Douglas needs that. He needs to win a Senate race right now. And if he goes with his party and with his president, he very well could lose his Senate seat. And then he'll be out of politics altogether. But if Douglas publicly disagreed with the president, if Douglas publicly went against the president, he was threatening to divide the Democratic Party completely. 
that Northern Democrats would flock to Douglas, Southern Democrats to the President, and the Democratic Party would be ripped apart. President Buchanan called Senator Douglas into a meeting uh, in the White House, and the two of them argued, with the, argued over this at length. Finally, with their voices rising, President Buchanan tried brute force. And he said, I desire you to remember, Mr. Douglas, that no Democrat ever yet differed from an administration of his own choice without being crushed. And the, it's obvious. President Buchanan is saying, get in line or, do n or expect that I will help you lose the, your Senate race. I will crush you, President Buchanan says. Well, Douglas looked President Buchanan right in the eye and said, Mr. President, I wish you to remember that General Jackson is dead. Implying that nobody except General Jackson, could, th Andrew Jackson, could throw threats like that around. And Douglas had his own people, and he was not going to be threatened. He looked the President in the eye and said, I wish you to remember that General Jackson is dead. Implying, you don't make threats to me, Mr. President. And he stalked out. From that point forward, the Democrats were completely split between northern and southern wings. Douglas, Douglas instructs his northern Democrats to side with the Republicans in Congress to fight the Lecompton Bill, to fight Kansas being admitted as a slave state. Republican plus northern Democratic opposition meant that the bill failed. Kansas did not become a state. Later that year, there was a more fair election held, and anti-slavery forces... Now, so the, the, the administration came back to Kansas and says, look, if you reject the pro-slavery constitution, you're not going to be allowed to become a state until there are 90,000 people. And that's not happening for a while. So if you reject this constitution, voters of Kansas, don't even consider becoming a state for the foreseeable future. And even with that threat, the voters of Kansas, when finally allowed to vote in a free and fair election, voted down the Lecompton Constitution, voted down the pro-slavery Constitution by a margin of six to one. Kansas would have to wait until the Civil War, when all the Southern representatives and senators were gone, to become a state. So here's our two characters in the drama. Lincoln and Douglas. Two of the most famous politicians in the country. Douglas just having gone to war with his own president, the leader of the moderate forces in Congress, Lincoln, the up-and-coming young lawyer from Illinois, now going face-to-face -face for a Senate seat in the vital state of Illinois. And that's number three, these debates between Lincoln and Douglas, the Lincoln-Douglas debates. That was the background. Douglas is split with Buchanan. Lincoln's House Divided speech, that was the background of these debates that crisscrossed the state of Illinois in the summer of 1858. Now, it's important to remember something. Historians for the last 150 years have gone over Lincoln and Douglas's debates with a fine-toothed comb, but it's important to remember something. They were running for office. They were campaigning. They were searching for votes. So their speeches obviously were tailored to meet the audiences that they were talking to. So let's talk about Senator Douglas. Here's Senator Douglas. Short, stocky, powerful, a great celebrity of his day. He arrived in a fancy train uh, with, you know, sumptuous decorations. He went to the sites of the debates, literally at the head of a brass band. Lincoln tried, excuse me, Douglas tried to paint Lincoln as an abolitionist who believed in racial equality and who would not abide by the Dred Scott decision. Douglas tries to paint himself a middle course. He tries to set up two extremes and puts himself in the middle. At one extreme is abolitionism and the belief in racial equality, and at the other extreme is southern extremism. 
Douglas says if you want to avoid civil war, you want to avoid these extremists having power. And if you want to avoid the extremists having power, you vote for me, Senator Douglas. We have Lincoln the abolitionist on one hand, we can't have him, and we have southern extremists like the president on another hand, we can't have him. So if you, voters of Illinois, want a middle, moderate, safe course that will avoid civil war, Douglas is your man. Douglas makes it clear to his audience that he believes slave he disliked slavery. He thought it was an awful moral evil. Um, but he did not believe in racial equality, nor did he believe in forcing slave owners to give up their slaves. In that case, he was just like Lincoln, that the two of them were very close um, in a lot of ways, politically. Then Lincoln almost traps him. At the northern Illinois town of Freeport, Lincoln tries to trap Douglas by asking him, Senator Douglas, Lincoln said, can a slavery, can a territory ban, exclude slavery before it becomes a state? Now, Lincoln is setting him up. Lincoln knows if Douglas says yes, he's violating the Dred Scott decision. But if he says no, that if Douglas says a territory could not exclude slavery, he's violating his own belief in popular sovereignty, which, as we know, Douglas made a career of. Douglas came down on the side of his old belief. Douglas said absolutely a territory could outlaw slavery before it became a state just by democratically electing that. A democratically elected legislature in a territory, Douglas said, could certainly ban slavery. Well, that vote saved him in Illinois, but that was the end of any chance that any Southerner, really, would ever vote for Douglas. That destroyed his possible future career in the South. He came out with this Freeport Doctrine that was simply a, a recitation, a reciting, of popular sovereignty. He is still about popular sovereignty. When the election was held, pro-Douglas state legislators narrowly defeated pro-Lincoln state legislators, and Douglas won the senatorial election. It was the last election Douglas would ever win, and it was the last election Lincoln would ever lose. Lincoln lost the election, but he did not lose the war. He came out of this a national political superstar. Lincoln had gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with the best the Democrats had to offer and had come out looking very good. Uh, his ability to think and reason and debate right with Douglas endeared him to the northern elite, and his rough-hewn and humorous style of speaking. You know, we, we like to, about, we, when we think of Lincoln, you know, we think of this, this, this somber man on the $5 bill or sitting there in the Lincoln Memorial all, you know. Lincoln was funny. Everybody said it. Lincoln was hilarious. Lincoln had a... St uh, a stack of stories memorized in his brain for every possible occasion. And when people came in angry, Lincoln would, you know, tell a joke, tell a story, and the person, you know, couldn't stay mad at the man. Lincoln was funny. And he was funny as a politician. You know, he would tell stories and burst elites' bubbles and, you know, relate anecdotes. And that made him, that endeared him to the common person, that Lincoln was the great commoner. Uh, in a lot of ways, and he was, we have to, Lincoln was funny, um, and a great storyteller, uh, with Ronald Reagan, the greatest storytellers uh, the presidency has ever seen. Lincoln lost the election, but he was still a major national figure. And letter H, Lincoln's Cooper Union speech solidifies his role as the leader of the Republic, or one of the leaders of the Republican Party. In early 1860, which was an election year, Lincoln gave a speech in New York City at the Cooper Union. He argues powerfully, yet simply, for preservation of the Union and the stopping of expansion of slavery. He is careful to note that he does not want to eliminate slavery where it already was. I cannot repeat that enough. And the Cooper Union speech given to the elite of the Republican Party, plus the debates, prove to, the, prove to Republicans that Lincoln could be the man for the job of president in 1860. And now we have to move again. 
number four, John Brown's Raid. And we talked about John Brown earlier in this block. The religious fanatic that had killed six pro-slavery settlers, him and his sons, with a broadsword. By 1859, John Brown has grown this long, biblical, patriotic beard. He is even deeper into his mental instability. He's, he's kind of going off the deep end. In Virginia, this slightly mad John Brown, is, who had escaped judgment, he was never called to justice for his murders in Kansas, was back at work. In northern Virginia, he gathered up 18 followers, black and white, and attacked an American military post at Harper's Ferry, Virginia. It was an arsenal where weapons and stores were kept. John Brown had this grandiose plan to take the fort, take the arsenal, use the weapons there to arm slaves, and then establish a black republic in the hills of western Virginia. He expected, when the slaves heard about this, he expected the slaves to come to him by the thousands. So with his 18 men, John Brown attacked and took over this arsenal. But no slaves came to join him. The United States Army, a detachment of it under the command of General Robert E. Lee, of the United States Army surrounded John Brown at Harper's Ferry, Virginia, and after a short battle in which 10 of Brown's 18 followers were killed, captured John Brown. And then the trial of John Brown just proved once and for all that calm, reasoned, rational debate in the United States was a thing of the past. In the North, John Brown was clearly a fanatic and mentally imbalanced if he was not insane. However, he was put up as this great abolitionist hero. And he was an abolitionist and he believed in racial equality, but he was hardly the greatest example of this. But he's put up as this great moral example by men like Emerson and Thoreau. Solid middle class people were involved in this raid. And... John Brown, instead of this mentally disturbed individual, starts to be seen as this great hero. In the South, Southerners looked at Brown and simply substituted Brown for everybody in the North. They assumed everybody in the North, if had the opportunity, would do exactly what John Brown did. And if John Brown, you know, wanted to arm the slaves, that meant the death of white Southerners. And that meant the end of white Southern society. And Southerners looked at John Brown and the Northern celebration of John Brown as confirmation of their beliefs as well. Northerners who were in the South at the time were beaten, evicted, thrown out. One was even lynched. John Brown had a very, well, in a way, unusual, or, and in and another way, your usual fate. Ignoring his clear derangement, the state of Virginia uh, sentenced John Brown to death. Now, before his execution, as people around the moderates around the country were begging for calm, Brown dropped his insanity, left him, and he became, as one person said, enormously dignified. With his big, sad eyes, he sat in his jail cell. He spoke calmly and rationally about racial equality, in which he truly fervently believed. And he said, which endeared him to the North and made Southerners freak out, Brown said, If it is deemed necessary that I should forfeit my life for the furtherance of the ends of justice and mingle my blood further with the blood of millions in this slave country whose rights are disregarded by wicked, cruel, and unjust enactments, I say, let it be done. So with that statement so powerful to abolitionists and so terrifying to Southerners, John Brown, with his sad eyes and his long biblical beard, went to his death. People in the North started singing, John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave, and on and on and on about what a martyr he was. Extremism simply multiplied. Senator Seward of New York spoke about an irrepressible conflict between slavery and freedom. Southerners blocked all legislation in the lame duck session of the 1856 Congress. Southerners misquoted Lincoln's house-divided speech, implying that he meant to destroy the South. 
Southern extremists started talking about a federal slave code, reviving the African slave trade, annexing Cuba and turning it into several slave states. Southern state legislatures passed extreme laws in 1859. Abolitionist speech became illegal. Mailing information about abolitionism became illegal. Free blacks living in the South were thrown out. To free your own slaves was declared illegal. And it became common knowledge in the South and openly discussed that if a Republican were ever to win a presidential election, the South would be forced into secession. Now it seems to us, studying the time, it seems as if Southerners were the extremists, the more extreme of the groups, but I want you guys to really understand that Southerners saw themselves as being surrounded by hostile forces, and not only that, these hostile forces in the North were growing stronger and stronger and stronger. And that brings us to the election of 1860. The Republican frontrunner was not actually Lincoln, but Senator Seward of New York. Many Republicans also favored Salmon P. Chase of Ohio, or even Edward Bates or Simon Cameron. But Lincoln was everyone's second choice. So when Seward and Chase kind of knocked each other out, everyone kind of looked around and said, What about Lincoln? And everyone said, Yeah, Lincoln. And on the third ballot, uh, Lincoln was nominated he would run for president for the Republican Party. The Democrats, with their split party. Stephen Douglas was the only hope, the only person that could even theoretically be able to keep Northern Democrats and Southern Democrats together, if only to defeat the Republican. And Douglas hoped that his ability to at least say, look, I've beaten Lincoln once, I can beat Lincoln. I'm the only one that can win votes in the North. You have to vote for me just to keep Lincoln out of the White House. That's what Douglas is going for. The Democrats met in convention in April, and the Southern delegates uh, of the Democratic Party demanded that the nominee not only declare all territories open for slavery, but declare that slavery was a positive good in and of itself. No Northerner was willing to do that, and the Southern delegates, their proposals shot down, walked out of the convention and left. The convention split apart in acrimony. They tried again in June and failed to nominate someone again. So you're talking now, you know, four months, or excuse me, five months before the election, and the Democrats don't even have a candidate. So the two sections of the Democratic Party met separately. The Northern Democrats nominated Douglas. The Southern Democrats nominated John C. Breckinridge of Kentucky. Let's go back to Abe. The campaign of 1860. What was the Republican platform? What did Republicans stand for in 1860? Letter A, and most importantly, no slavery in any territory. Neither Congress nor any legislature could legally allow slavery in any territory. A high tariff, which makes northern manufacturers happy. A Homestead Act, which provided free land for settlers, makes westerners happy. Internal improvements. Um, railroads and the like makes businesses happy. No restriction on immigration. This was a popular and powerful platform in the North. Douglas's platform, the Northern Democrats, he stood by his Freeport doctrine of popular sovereignty. Otherwise, they're Jacksonian Democrats. The Southern Democratic Party, John C. Breckinridge, entirely pro-slavery, entirely pro-states' rights, and otherwise, they're also usual Jacksonian Democrats. And then a, a fourth party popped up called the Constitutional Union Party, which nominated John Bell. After Lincoln's nomination, the remnants of the Whigs and the American Know-Nothing Party, and those of them who had not joined the Republicans, created the Constitutional Union Party. And their platform was an exercise in avoiding reality completely. They said, follow the Constitution, no secession, and we're not going to talk about slavery at all. Obviously, this is a political campaign a political party um, that is willfully ignoring reality. 
The campaign. It was soon clear that Lincoln would win the election because he was more popular than Douglas in the vote-rich northern and western states. Lincoln did not campaign at all. He stayed home in Illinois and made no campaign statements. If only presidential campaigns were like that today. Douglas, to his credit, for the first time in his life, overcomes his ambition, and in his finest moment, Douglas said, I will go south and try to save the Union. He went south and begged Southerners to support whoever won the election in the name of the Union. And he was the only candidate, he was the only candidate that campaigned in both sections of the country, to his credit. The results in November were not particularly close. Lincoln won 180 electoral votes and 1.8 million uh, popular. Stephen Douglas only won 12 electoral votes. He only won two states, Missouri and New Jersey. Uh, Missouri and New Jersey. And 1.4 million popular votes. Breckenridge in the South won 72 electoral votes um, and 850,000 popular. John Bell, the Constitutional Union Party, 39 electoral votes, 590,000 popular. If you look at the map, John Bell, the constitutional unionist, wins votes in the border states where the results of disunion and the results of secession will be the worst. The people there were terrified of the country splitting apart. So Lincoln has been elected president. He's elected in November. He does not become president until March. That's the lame duck period. What time? Oh, okay. All right. Letter number seven, secession. It's finally come to this. Days after Lincoln's victory, South Carolina's government ordered an election of delegates to a convention to decide the state's future. And on December 20th, 1860, with ringing speeches about how Lincoln was going to end the way of life and destroy the South, South Carolina voted overwhelmingly to secede from the United States of America. It based its actions on Calhoun's exposi exposition and protest, and all the way going back to Jefferson and Madison's Virginia and Kentucky resolves that South Carolina announced that it was resuming her position among the separate and equal nations of the earth, and that language is consciously copying Jefferson's Declaration of Independence. In 1832, during the nullification crisis, South Carolina could get no support from other southern states. That's different in 1860. By February 1st, six other states of the Lower South had voted to secede as well. Georgia, Florida, Alabama, Louisiana, and Texas. And Mississippi, I forgot about Mississippi on your notes, and Mississippi all voted to secede. Representatives from those states met in Montgomery, Alabama, and announced the creation of a new nation, the Confederate States of America. The northern southern states, Virginia, Tennessee, North Carolina, and Arkansas did not secede. They stayed in the Union, but they said, we will secede if Lincoln fought to keep the six southern states in the Union. So that northern tier of southern states, Virginia and North Carolina uh, be, and Tennessee being the most important, said, we're sticking with the Union as long as the Union lets the other southern states go. They said the minute Lincoln says that he will fight to keep those states in the Union, we're out. The Union had been sundered, split apart. President Buchanan, in a complete lack of action, which has, for the last 150 years, made him rank dead last among all American presidents, was against secession, but he did not see a constitutional argument that would allow him to forcefully stop it. And that's the difference between Jackson and Buchanan. Buchanan wrung his hands and said, I don't know what to do. Border states politicians we're desperately looking for a way out, a compromise. And the most, uh, the one that came the closest, although it didn't come close at all, the most famous was known as letter B, the Crittenden 
Compromise. And it was called the Crittenden Compromise because of its sponsor, John J. Crittenden, Senator from Kentucky, desperately offered up a compromise. He said, we're going to have two constitutional amendments. One, go back to the original Missouri Compromise. Draw the line all the way to the Pacific Ocean. Slavery will always be allowed below it, and slavery will never be allowed above it. If it's a constitutional amendment, the Supreme Court can't touch it. Guys, let's settle this once and for all. Take the old line, yes, slavery below, no slavery above, please. It also, through a second amendment, promised the South that no amendment to the Constitution in the future would ever interfere with slavery where it existed. Two things in Crittenden's Compromise. Extend the Missouri Compromise line, no amendment to interfere with slavery in southern states. Thirty years earlier, this had worked. But time and years of extremism on both sides had made compromise impossible. Crittenden is a sad character. He is desperate to pass this law. Why? He has two sons. One son is preparing to be a Confederate general, and another son is preparing to be a Northern Union general. Crittenden walked the halls of Congress desperately looking for people to sign on to his idea, but found nearly no one. No one left was willing to compromise to save the Union. President-elect Lincoln came out against the compromise as giving too much to the South. Lincoln said, I have not been elected to allow for the extension of slavery anywhere. And Crittenden's compromise got nowhere. Down in Montgomery, the new Confederate States of America busied themselves with the actions of, re actions of creating a government. They wrote a constitution that was nearly identical to the American Constitution, but with stronger statements of states' rights and specific protections for slavery. They elected Jefferson Davis, a former senator and former Secretary of War, who was a model slave owner, was famous for treating his slaves well. They elected Jefferson Davis as their president. They sent diplomatic ambassadors to Europe, hoping for official recognition of their country. Most importantly for our story, they seized federal forts, federal arsenals, federal magazines, and other government property. By April, only two forts in the entire South remained in the hands of the American army. The South created an army, they created a navy, they created a treasury, a diplomatic corps, they created a country. By the end of February, about a week before Lincoln's inauguration, President Buchanan in Washington fumbled around helplessly, and in Illinois, President Lincoln shuffled his cabinet and on the advice of a small girl, grew a beard. As he got in his train at the end of February 1861 and headed east, Lincoln was faced with a crisis unlike any in American history. It would now be up to him to save his country.